Hi, I'm Aaron of Living Science Videos. Today I'm going to talk a little bit more about pea plants like I did in the last video. Of course, I'm also going to go over more than just the genetics of the simple pea plant and Gregor Mendel, whose studies are the foundations of modern genetics. Thank you, anti-joke chicken. Normally he tells anti-jokes, so let's let him share one. We'll talk more about the genetics of chickens later, but first let's finish talking about pea plant genetics. You see, when Mendel studied the traits of pea plants, he mostly studied what were just two outcomes, traits that were controlled by genes that fortunately were controlled by just two alleles, like the color of pea plants and their stem lengths. Bet you thought I was done talking about pea plants in the last video. You might want to go back and have a look at that uh, for the introduction to genetics if you have questions here. On the two pea plant chromosomes in this diagram, you'll see that there are two different alleles for two of the traits Mendel was studying. Also notice that the dominant trait is noted with a capital letter and the recessive trait is noted with a lowercase letter. So in this case, the pea plant flower will be purple if the purple allele is present because it is dominant. Traits that only have two alleles are simple to predict their outcome and worked well for Mendel's experiments predicting future traits. Can you imagine a world where there are only two alleles? It only resulted in two options for every trait though? Human eye color would always be either brown or blue, for example. Or everyone would be short or tall, no in between. The traits that Mendel experimented on were easy to isolate, predict, and study for that reason. And to this day, traits that are located on only two alleles of a single gene where only one allele can completely dominate the other are called, fittingly enough, Mendelian traits. Even amongst traits that have only one gene and two alleles, in rare cases certain dominant traits are rarer than recessive traits. Like, did you know that having five fingers isn't always dominant? There is more than one gene that can control the number of your fingers. The condition known as polydactyly is where an organism has more than the standard number of phalanges, or in humans, fingers, and can be caused by more than one hereditary pattern. In many cases, it is caused by a simple Mendelian trait. Most humans, and even cats, except for this cute kitty, have the recessive copy that gives us five digits, at least on the front paws when it comes to cats. Usually they have four normal toes on each foot with a tiny vestigial dew claw on the front paws. But polydactyl cats might have one or more of these dew claws appear as full-size toes. Save your questions for after the video, kitty. Why, if polydactyly is the dominant allele, do most humans and cute kitties have only five digits? It's because the allele for more than five fingers, or even five toes, is not as common. Why do many animals have five digits then? Even whales. If you look at the bones inside their flippers, they have five digits. We know from fossil records that the ancestor of all land mammals with digits, the tetrapods, meaning four limbs, lived 360 million years ago and could have six, seven, or eight digits. This is ichthyostega. It's sort of a half fish or former fish evolving adaptations for land. These lived about 365 to 380 million years ago. At first glance, it looks like it has a familiar five-fingered hand, but what is actually a thumb on you and a dew claw on your cat is actually three different toes pressed together in this fishy foot. Five or fewer digits evolved 340 million years ago alongside the development of complex wrist and ankle bones needed to help terrestrial animals move on to land, rather than simpler arrangements from fish fins. So this guy inherited an ancient genome from our ancestors, the fish. No, really, because we share a common ancestor with ray fin fish that lived over 430 million years ago. The buoyancy bladder in modern ray fin fish had apparently evolved from a simple sort of lung in more primitive fish that could also breathe air. It turns out that scientists have discovered the genes responsible for the development of digits in tetrapods like me and you. In the 1990s, evolutionary biologist Dr. Neil Shubin discovered which Hox genes are responsible for regulating development of wrist, ankles, and digits, Hox A13 and Hox D13. He found that when you shut those genes down in mice, that legs developed, but wrists, ankles, and digits did not. Later in 2013, a researcher in his lab, Tetsuya Nakamura, found a way to prove that if you interfered with those same Hox genes in a zebrafish, that their rays became deformed. 
Yet another graduate student, Andrew Gerke, devised a way to track the development of rays and fins by injecting embryos with a glowing dye to trace the growth of fins. What they discovered was that the same Hox genes controlled the development of rays and digits in both tetrapods and fish. Now, I hinted that there were more hereditary patterns than simple and predictable Mendelian traits, and even those have exceptions. We just talked about how a normally dominant gene like polydactyly is rare. The biology of life is often not that simply explained, so let's look at other more complex patterns of inheritance that are still the result of two different alleles in the same gene. Like, what if a trait doesn't completely dominate? Sticking with flower color, let's look at a new flower. Finally, no more pea plants. I'm kidding, I actually like peas. Eat your peas, they're good for you. But now let's look at a plant that has more than two flower colors, the lovely snapdragon. This snapdragon has two alleles, one for red plant color and one for white plant color. But these snapdragons have three color variations. Some snapdragons are pink. Why is that? If you look at this Punnett square, the red or R allele, when it is paired with the W or white allele, doesn't completely dominate it and gets pink instead. This heredity pattern is called incomplete dominance because, as you probably guessed, a dominant allele doesn't dominate a trait completely or is only partially dominant. One of the most famous examples of incomplete dominance is a chicken. The Andalusian fowl is a chicken with a white allele and one with a black allele, but it can produce blue offspring because of incomplete dominance. That is the cause of many human traits as well. Not all of our traits are simple Mendelian traits with only two distinct options. They're not always completely dominant. They can also be incompletely dominant or co-dominant. For example, voice pitch and the size of your upper lip are often a combination of two traits because of incomplete dominance. A good example of this can be found in hair proteins. When you combine an allele for curly and straight hair, you get wavy hair due to incomplete dominance. I said we would talk about heredity patterns in chickens, so here's another chicken matchup. Let's say that you have a rooster with black feathers and you cross that with a chicken with white feathers. What can the colors of their feathers be? Since chicken feather color isn't a simple Mendelian trait, something different happens, rather than black or white offspring depending on the presence of the dominant allele. Notice that in this Punnett square that white feathers are noted with an F superscript W and black feathers are noted with an F superscript B. In an Andalusian chicken, you'd get a blue chicken, but here the resulting offspring have both black and white feathers, sometimes even a checkerboard pattern if the feathers are spread evenly enough. Like this one, since you see both feather colors, both alleles for these colors, the traits that are expressed, are what are called codominance. Codominance happens when both alleles are expressed equally in the offspring. In human blood types, A and B are codominant and O is recessive. Remember that and let's look back at the possible physical expressions and phenotypes that come from the alleles A, B, and O. Unlike simple Mendelian dominance where there is only completely dominant or recessive traits, blood type expression is codominant. So on the first line, A from the mother and A from the father results in an offspring with the A blood type like you would expect. A dominant A and a recessive O produces the A blood type because the A dominates the O. However, when you have a dominant A and a dominant B, you get the AB blood type because they are codominant. Why do tabby cats have stripes? Again, codominance. As you may have already guessed, some traits we already discussed in humans are simple Mendelian traits like having attached earlobes or not, and others like wavy hair are the result of incomplete dominance. Still others like blood type are caused by codominance. This is not a chicken, but a golden pheasant. Both domestic chickens and golden pheasants are in the pheasant family, though, Pheasianinae. There are still more heredity problems for other traits, some even involving more than a single gene that we will get to in the next video. What you see in us and other species, like chickens and some of the things you don't see, like blood type, are the result of multiple alleles from your parents combining in different random patterns to make a wonderful kaleidoscope of traits that produce unique offspring. And just for fun, here to answer another often asked question about chickens is Micro Raw. Have you ever pondered upon the philosophy of the chicken egg paradox? Have you ever thought about how a chicken could be born without an egg, and vice versa? Well, yippee ki -yay, I'm about. Wait, did I just say yippee ki -yay? No, 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 seriously, I just said yippee ki -yay. Well, Well, anyways, I'm going to answer the ancient poulterous question. It's literally the oldest joke in the book, except that it really isn't. 
uh, okay, did, did you even listen to me? Do you listen to what I just said? It's the chicken or the egg, not the chicken crossing the road. The chicken-egg paradox is actually very puzzling, and by that I mean it really isn't. Hard-shelled eggs are an ancestral condition of amniota. Amniota evolved around 300 million years ago. It includes both synapsids, mammals and related animals like Adaphosaurus, and sauropsids, like traditional reptiles, Lepidosaurs, and archosaurs, like stem birds, pterosaurs and dinosaurs, and some other things, aka Avametatarsalia, and stem crocodilians, Pseudosuchians. Therefore, eggs came around 300 million years before domesticated chickens could even lay one. In the end, the chicken-egg paradox isn't a paradox at all, unless you ignore evolution, a defining character of life. But character is a Linnaean term, and doesn't Linnaean taxonomy completely ignore evolution? By the way, please switch to cladistics. Linnaean taxonomy is so strange and can't apply to extinct organisms. It's just way easier to use cladistics. Ple please, stop messing around with kingdoms and classes and phylum. Just say a few key clades and be done. Also, according to Linnaean taxonomy, Hesperornis is not a bird, because it has teeth, but Psittacosaurus might be considered a bird, because it has what may be feather quills. I mean, seriously? This is why classification should not be limited to characteristics alone. It should instead be determined by phylogeny, an organism's evident evolutionary ancestry.